Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brett LaBella. I'm the Director of Regional History and Genealogy here at Pikes Peak Library District. I'm also a Colorado Humanities Board member. And I'd like to welcome you guys to our uh, facility here. This is East Library uh, down here in Colorado Springs. Um, thank you for our sponsors today, uh, Unite for Literacy, Vectra Bank, and the Colorado Sun, with whom we partner on Sunlit's Sunday excerpts of Colorado authors' books. Before we get to the reading, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of, of people. Uh, first, Colorado Humanities technical producer, Charlene Emery, and marketing coordinator, Betsy Lopez. They're here in the audience. In the back, in the audience. I'd also like to thank Mary Hickey, Colorado Center for the Book Programs Coordinator, uh, for all of her hard work on this program um, and the book series that um, we will be down here in Colorado Springs for the next month or so. She's home at s home sick right now um, and regrets not being able to, to be here, but we really couldn't do it without Mary's uh, efforts as well. Uh, tonight I'm pleased to introduce you to six talented writers whose books have been named by Colorado Book o Award selectors as finalists in the categories of historical fiction, history and biography, and pictorial categories. The finalists from the pictorial category will start, followed by finalists in the history and biography category, and we will conclude with finalists from the historical fiction. There will be a Q&A with each author after their reading, and we'll move quickly, keeping everyone to their time limits. So I think Charlene will keep us on pace, okay? Copies of the finalist books are available for purchase in the back, um, and that, that will be also be online as well, uh, through Poor Richard's Books and Gifts, um, who is the 2023 Colorado Book Awards official bookseller. Um, so that's in the very, very back. Thank you very much. Please ask finalists uh, to sign your books. Um, they'll be around at the end. Um, and our first reader today is in the pictorial category, and it's Barbara Ford and Roberta Smith, authors of In Pursuit of Happenstance. In the 68-page book, Smith's imagery square dances with Ford's poetry. Roberta Smith has worked as a graphic artist, children's book illustrator, jewelry designer, and muralist before becoming an award-winning mixed media artist. She has exhibited in galleries and invitational shows, and her work is represented in public and private collections throughout the country. Barbara Ford's work has been published in a variety of publications, and, has, and she has presented her poetry at festivals and conferences throughout the state. Her radio program, Poets and Minstrels, has aired for 17 years in Salida, where they both live. Barbara, Roberta, I'll turn the tables over for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> First of all, I would like to acknowledge the uh, staff at Colorado Humanities and Center for the Book for all their hard work and dedication um, toward the Colorado Book Awards. <clears throat> and also acknowledge the judges who took the time to um, review the submissions. So thank you and thank you all for being here. So Barbara proposed this book idea to me, and being a big fan of her poetry, I enthusiastically agreed. As, as Barbara wrote in the book, it began as a firefly dancing between her house and mine, and we exchanged emails with poems and images. And then the process moved to my house where we spent numerous days with vast array of poems and images spread out on my dining room table. And that's where we began to see the magic happen as poems and images floated together serendipitous, serendipitously and paired up. So that was how it started. Barbara? I just want to say that it was like my poems fell in love with Roberta's art and it was a mutual attraction and we had to let that relationship happen and play out in, in pursuit of happenstance. We kind of stood back and let our work be together and it was quite uncanny in that I was not writing ekphrastic poems and she was not 
taking my poems and creating her images. Again, it was, it was quite synergistic. I think I learned the meaning of the word synergy working with Roberta. And I also learned the profundity of collaboration, which I never thought I would, because I am not one who works well with others. And uh, I probably never will be, except for this one great exception. And that has to do with <laughs> how kind Roberta is. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to show some images of um, my artwork, and Barbara will read a number of accompanying poems. Um, and I'll read the titles of uh, Roberta's work, because her titles are um, art in themselves. So I want you to hear her titles also. Okay, so my work, as you will see, um, exhibits a wide variety of techniques and media. And I'm not going to talk about that, but if anybody has any questions about it, I'd be happy to talk with you individually later. I suggested the title of the book because um, I thought it was kind of a playful take on what I always loved, the uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in the Constitution. So this was our pursuit. <laughs> Of both happiness and, and happiness. Happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next slide. And the title of this piece is A Delicate Balance. The title of this piece is I Ache in the Places I Used to Play. We're going to move on to the next one. I'm going to no. read the poem that uh, accompanies this piece. This piece is titled by Roberta The Nearby Far Away, and the poem that jumped into its lap was caveat emptor, which is when we're in the market to buy the hook, line, and sinker of it, the panoramic surround of endless tender attachment, the scrumptious, sumptuous fur coat of it to be doted upon, to sail our boat upon the waters of undying love like Cleopatra, to feel a queen a Botticelli beauty toted on a barge by a lover larger than life, begging us to be soulmate, goddess, wife. Let us have it just once. The brief suspension of reason for passion, the boa constricting addiction to being adored nightly by one destined to squeeze too tightly, ultimately sending us running, not walking, from magnetic attraction, demoted to stalking. Next, please. The next slide is Heed the Palette. That's my title. Roberta's title is Confetti Fingerprints. On a blank canvas, make the first mark. Begin to assemble the disparate parts. Every painter learns the necessity of value played out in the use of light and dark. Every artist knows black and white are essential in the making of true evolutionary art. This is titled Once Upon a Time, and the next one is entitled Abundance. And I'm not going to read the poem, but the poem that accompanies those two images is 13 Bike Rides. And then we're going to move on to, the, this image is uh, entitled, Don't Get Fooled Again. It is, I can disclose to you, Roberta's self-portrait. And I can disclose to you that the poem that I'm going to read is my self-portrait. And, and notice the two little girls up, up there. The, the <laughs> <laughs> Self-possession is the title of mine. If I'm going to have a nemesis, let her be Dr. Mesmer's most promising understudy. Let her set up shop in my dreams as she haunts my days with shells crunching underfoot from her nocturnal nut cracking. Let her steal from me in plain sight, then charge me double for a tenth of it back. Let her waylay my letters and phone calls so she's the only one ringing my bell at my most inconvenient hour. Let her alternate between smothering and cold shouldering while excelling at randomness. Let her be chosen whenever I am rejected and have her write the press release 
to drive home the stain. When you catch us side by each in the rear booth, desultorily sipping from one tall glass, tenderly tucking errant locks of hair behind the other's ear, what can I say? I'd be half a woman without her. Next slide. Roberta's title is One Song, Many Voices to this image, which is very washed out here. It's very blue uh, in the book and in real life. The title of the poem that goes with One Song, Many Voices is Marriage. We have lived together a long time on an island in the middle of a wide lake building a language we both can understand. On cold, clear mornings, a delicate veneer of ice reminds us how far we have come from our native tongues, how far and still are the countries we come from on opposite sides of the water. Next image is, it rang, I answered, Wrong answer. Wrong number. Wrong number. I wrote, I wrote it down wrong. <laughs> Keep going. One more image. The answer is not written. And the next is Patriot Act. And that is right when you, you get, get work. work. <laughs> I have it in the back. The next one is... It's here somewhere. <laughs> I keep looking for it. Next image. Oh, Generous Hands Full of Mystery is the Roberta's title. And next is <laughs> Good Grief. Next is Duende. And the poem that goes with Duende is While We Sleep. Through the walls of our mild lives, we sometimes hear the beating of a bolder self, the telltale sound of what we hide, the profligate glory of our other side. Next slide, please. This is Sea of Dreams. Next, Ruby Tuesday. And the final image and poem in the book, okay. New Twist, New New twist, twist on, on Old, old ideas, ideas, is Roberta's title. And my poem, which I want to preface this with, we dedicated the book to Kent Harriff in his memory. We were fortunate to know Kent. We were fortunate to live in the same community as Kent. And he was our friend. And he was probably one of the most encouraging artists either of us have ever met. Very supportive. and. As I said, we dedicated the book to him. And this poem is about Kent Harreth. The blessing on his lips. On the shelf beside the chair in his last months, a stack of books by all the big names in spirituality on the subject of death. After he took his final breath, he quickly became more knowledgeable than they, as he gave his thanks for all their guessing. So I would like to close with gratitude to Barbara for suggesting this collaboration and being such a great collaborator. <laughs> um, I also want to thank her for a poem that she wrote for me quite a while ago after visiting my website. And it appears on the last three lines of it are on the back cover our, of our book. And it, it, this really moves me. She says, if you look inside her jewel box mind, you'll find the source of her staining art behind which hides a poet's heart. heart. Behind which hides a poet's heart. Thanks, everybody, for listening. It was a pleasure to present this book to you, as it was a pleasure to make it. OK, before you
forget to take a seat. If there are any questions from the audience, Yes, uh, there seems to be a lot of bird imagery in your work. Uh, what is the story behind that? Well, there are a lot of stories behind that. Um, I love birds, particularly ravens, and um, they symbolize a lot of different things to me. And so um, I do use them repeatedly. But yeah, I'm a birder and bird lover. And she has a lot of, of ravens in her house. Mm -hmm. None of them are alive, but they are represented everywhere. Next, we have the book To Aspen and Back, An American Journey by Peggy Clifford, David Heiser, Daniel Joseph Watkins. Uh, Peggy Clifford was a copyright reporter in Pittsburgh and New York City before moving to Aspen in 1953. She later ma became managing editor of the Aspen Times and passed away in 2017. David Heiser has won multiple awards, including the 2015 Pictorial Colorado Book Award for High Roads to Aspen, and Daniel Joseph Watkins won the 2012 Pictorial Colorado Book Award for Thomas W. Benton, artist slash activist. David lives in Carbondale, and Daniel lives in Aspen. All right, thank you all for having me here, and to the Colorado Humanities for putting this on. Um, I wish David could have joined me. He is 90, nearing 90, and he didn't want to make the trip, so I told him I would represent him here. He's a very famous National Geographic photographer and traveled all over the world, and I got to know David through work on a book and film that I produced about Hunter Thompson's campaign for sheriff in Aspen. Um, that's kind of some of the background, and what I'll mention about Peggy, who wrote the text for To Aspen and Back, is that she came, she was in Aspen beginning in 1953 writing about the town. She wrote a million words about Aspen. She chronicled the town uh, more than anybody uh, up until 1979. Um, Hunter Thompson the famous Gonzo journalist came to Aspen to meet Peggy. Uh, they got connected, they became fast friends, and I actually believe that Peggy really influenced Hunter's writing, um, which is, you know, a lot of people try to emulate Hunter Thompson, which is impossible, but to think about his inspirations, and Peggy was a no-nonsense writer and journalist and really captured the town you know, Aspen is one of the only places that can be called almost an idea, not a place. I like to call it the world's most successful failed utopia, or a velvet rut, or a pleasure slum, a candy ass town. And it's also a very interesting place in America. Um, and so Peggy captured the town and this book. And what I wanted to do is Aspen had such a rich photographic history. You know, the Aspen Institute was founded in the late 40s by Walter and Elizabeth Pepke. They brought the world's top photographers to Aspen. There was a photographic school called the Center of the Eye. World famous photographers like Henry Cartier-Bresson would come to Aspen, Bob Chamberlain, Ferenc Berko. And what I wanted to do is pair Peggy's great writing with the best photos in Aspen history. And I know you can't see it, and I didn't want to go through all the uh, images in like a slideshow, but the point that I was going to mention is working with David, we laid out Peggy's text, and on each page, we included an image of what she's talking about, whether it be a person, a place, an idea, an event, and so, really, it was a, a, a huge collaborative effort that took 10 years to bring this book back to life. And David and I worked on the images. Kurt Carpenter was the designer. Catherine Lutz added captions for each of the images that complement the text. And the book really captures not only Aspen, but what was happening in America. 
And I think that Peggy had a really strong argument to say that, you know, after World War II, we had a lot of potential as a culture and a society. And ideas were the currency in Aspen, and it was cultural. And whether it be music, philosophy, ideas, we have the Aspen idea. It's the mind, the body, the spirit. Those were what we would call cultural capital. The goal of life was to fill your mind with ideas and to really expand upon what it means to be human. Well, in America and in Aspen, we have sort of lost our way. And it seems to me like the primary motivation for most of Western culture and definitely in America and definitely in Aspen, the goal is the accumulation of wealth rather than the accumulation of ideas. And so Peggy ties Aspen's fate to America's fate. And I think you could look at since World War II, it's become a little ironic that Aspen was founded as a utopia where ideas would be cherished and the goal of life was to grow your mind and to fill it with the wondrous things of the world. Whereas now Aspen has become sort of a symbol of the 1% or the one-tenth of 1% and that Aspen has embraced a lot of what we would call conspicuous consumption. So I think that the story is really important for not only telling the story of Aspen, but tying it to America. And then having these wonderful photos, over 200 world-class photos that illustrate this story. Um, so it's not just about Aspen, it's about America, and it's about our culture. And then I'll close by just saying a few words. Um, Elizabeth Pepke was really the founder of the reemergence of Aspen in 1947. Her and her husband, Walter Pepke, bought the town. They created the Aspen Institute, the Aspen Ski Company. They re renovated the Wheeler Opera House, the Hotel Jerome. They brought all the intellectuals. They brought, Walter, they brought the Bauhaus Herbert Beyer. They brought architects. They brought talented artists. And they created this, Peggy mentions, maybe a, a endless stream of entertaining intellectual dinner guests. But they also really created the modern day Aspen. And after 40 years, Elizabeth Pepke looked back on Aspen and she famously remarked on the shift at the close of the 1980 International Design Conference with the following. This is Elizabeth Pepke talking. Are we going to kill the golden goose by feeding the animal until its liver becomes distended and we produce a pate, which is so rich that none of us can digest it anymore? What price glory? She told a reporter that Aspen had become a town of glitz and glamour, a nut without a kernel. My heart, she said, is broken. Elizabeth Pepke and Peggy Clifford felt the same way I do, but that does not mean that we don't care deeply about Aspen. There are so many reasons we still love Aspen and what it means and what it offers. So, you know, the, the book is definitely has a, a charged nature about where we're at. And the last thing I'll close by saying is that the book really struck a chord with the community and people that care about the town. And the book sold out in six months. We printed 1,500 copies. and. We've printed a second edition that just arrived. And this summer, I'm going to be hosting a series of events centered around the book and the people involved in the book um, to kind of give people a better understanding of why Aspen came to be the place uh, that it is today. There were over 50 photographers that we used their photos. And one of the things that I wanted to do with the book was spare no expense because I wanted to make something that was kind of a love letter to the town that I love. And so we ended up licensing the world's best photos. And like I mentioned, like Cartier-Bresson, Bob Chamberlain, Bob Krieger. And part of the book, the reason why it took so long, it took 10 years to 
do the whole project um, was because we wanted to really make every effort to make the book as interesting and beautiful as possible. This cover is inspired by Herbert Beyer. He's a famous Bauhaus artist who designed the Aspen Institute. There's a, a foil Aspen leaf on the inside. And so part of the reason it took so long was because we really spared no expense in getting all the best photos. And if there was a photo that David or I really liked, we licensed it and then included it. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much. One more. Yep, okay, one more. So it looks like a very expensive project. How did you finance or find a publisher to do your book? Yeah, so I have my own publishing company. It's called the Meat Possum Press. And I've published three books. One was Thomas W. Benton, Artist Activist, which won in 2012. Then I produced Freak Power, Hunter S. Thompson's Campaign for Sheriff. That book was turned into a film, actually two films. Um, the way I financed this book was it quickly spiraled out of control. Um, and I went to various community members in Aspen who I knew cared about Aspen history. And I offered them sort of pseudo sponsorships where at the beginning of the book, there's a few names that people get thanked. And then at the back of the book, same thing. And so I was very fortunate to have a lot of people that care about Aspen and history. So being a wealthy town, I just targeted uh, the people that I knew would care to help me publish it. And then those financial contributions allow us to keep the book where you charge seventy nine ninety nine. But when I added up all the costs of the book, it would be like a several hundred dollar book. But we subsidized it because I wanted the book to be on every coffee table in town and I wanted people that are moving to Aspen and that live there to appreciate it and the history behind it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the classic story of gentrification on steroids. You know, you have the intellectuals, the artists, the writers. Then you have the famous people that want to hang out with the artists. And then you have the rich people that want to hang out with the famous people. So there's kind of this, you know, gradual march to the bottom. Um, and so... There were a lot of famous people, and they're all mentioned in the book, whether it was Jack Nicholson or Steve Martin or Hunter Thompson or the Eagles. Um, and that's an interesting story about Aspen. You know, it attracts a certain breed of people that are, you know, movers and shakers. And now they say we have 200 billionaires. Um, it's the highest density of wealth in the world. And it's a crazy place, but the important thing is, is that it's a place that was founded because of the beauty of the place and the core of the original cultural destination is still there and we still have an, a lot of amazing things that keep Aspen special and that's why I wanted to bring this book to life was t for people that live there to understand why Aspen is special and this book does that. Daniel, I definitely think Thank that you. people are going to want to read it based on the questions here, so yeah, thank you, so thank you very much. It. Yeah. The third finalist in the pictorial category could not be here tonight, uh, but that is Andrea Monath Schumacher, the author of Vibrant Interiors. Her debut interior design book explores her creativity and ability to transform interior spaces into something unique for each client. Andrea Monath, Monath Schumacher started her company in 1999 and has built Andrea Schumacher Interiors into the premier residential interior design firm in Denver, Colorado that has expanded recently into Santa Barbara, California. The award-winning firm consistently appears in publications such as Colorado Homes, Mountain Living, and Western Art and Architecture. Now we will hear from one of our finalists in the history and biography category. 
Uh, Mark Lee Gardner's book, The Earth is All That Lasts, Crazy Horse Sitting Bull and the Last Stand of the Great Sioux Nation, is based on years of research that draws on a wealth of previously ignored primary sources and chronicles the, ex the experiences of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull. Mark Lee Gardner is the author of Rough Riders, To Hell on a Fast Horse, and Shot All to Hell, which received multiple awards, including a Spur Award from the Western Writers of America. Gardner has appeared on PBS's American Experience, as well as the History Channel, AMC, the Travel Channel, and NPR. He has written for the National Geographic History, American Heritage, the Los Angeles Times, True West, and American Cowboy. He lives in Cascade. Mark? Thank you. Yeah, I, I had a pretty short drive here from Ute Pass to the library. Um, yeah, I uh, uh, wanted to give you a little background on, on how this book came about. Um, uh, I was uh, born far away from Lakota country uh, in northwest Missouri. My, my family for many generations uh, were loggers and cut maples and walnuts and oaks and my dad was a logger and when I was in school I spent summers helping my dad and I didn't run the chainsaw which was about as big as I am but I hauled the gas and the oil and spent many days in the deep woods in Missouri. Um, but my dad made sure during the summers he would take off 10 days to two weeks and he would take our family on a vacation and that would include me and my two sisters and my mom. Now, my dad, uh, I think I don't think he made it through the sixth grade because he had to go to work in the woods with my granddad. My mom had me when she was 17, so she didn't finish high school. So I, I realized later that these trips were not just about educating their children, but also educating themselves. They'd really hardly been out of the state of Missouri. And we hit, they were history buffs and antique collectors, so we hit every historic fort, house, battlefield throughout the country. And one of my earliest memories is visiting Little Bighorn Battlefield in Montana. We're on June 25th, 1876. Custer and the 7th Cavalry were defeated by Lakotas and Cheyennes and Arapahoes and Dakotas. And it was such an amazing experience for me as a child. It remains an amazing experience when you visit today. but. Um, uh, it was just so uh, curious and mysterious and awesome and, you know, this story. As a boy, you're fascinated by, you know, Custer and more than 200 of his men uh, were annihilated and no one was left to tell the tale. Well, as I got older, I realized that actually there were lots of people that were left to tell the tale and those were the ones who defeated Custer, those Lakotas and the Cheyennes and others that were under Two Moons and Sitting Bull and crazy horse and I didn't end up uh, obviously becoming a logger full time and um, I uh, ended up working for the National Park Service during the summers and uh, was a museum director for the Colorado Historical Society and uh, I've written many things for the National Park Service. In fact, I, one of my greatest pleasures was I got to write the guidebook for Little Bighorn that I visited as a child and if you go to the battlefield today at the visitor center uh, you'll find my guidebook there still for sale. Um, but uh, as an author and looking for the next book, I, I always remain fascinated by the Lakota side, the story, the story of the victors. And that's how this book, The Earth is All That Last, came about. It's the story of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, the, the most fierce of those who were opposed to cooperating with the white man. Uh, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse never signed a treaty. Uh, they didn't have treaty councils. Uh, like other uh, Indian leaders. And so this book is their story and, and how they fought until their deaths to um, preserve their people and their culture and their land. And it was a constant battle for most of their adult life until they were both murdered, um, you know, uh, in bungled, what we would say were bungled uh, arrest attempts. Very tragic. I, you know, this is a sad story, I will admit, but I also find, think, or I hope that it is an inspiring story because these two men never wavered from their resolve in resisting the encroachment and resisting the U.S. government's attempt to erase their culture, uh, and they died fighting for that. So 
and they they serve as inspiration today. Whether it's uh, the Wounded Knee takeover in 1973, or the the, the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, um, the fight to retain or take back the Black Hills, they still inspire Americans uh, to this day, and I think um, their lives are just fascinating. So I'm going to read a short excerpt. Um, this is. Uh, in the summer of 1876, prior to the Battle of Little Bighorn. Sitting Bull was a holy man as well as a leader of his people, and he was known for his power of prophecy to see into the future. And this talks about this and the great sun dance that was held uh, in southern Montana near Deer Rocks in June of 1876. As the moon when leaves turned green gave way to the moon of the wild turnip, the end of May, Sitting Bull became more worried for his people. A party of Cheyennes just arrived from one of the agencies confirmed that lots of soldiers were being sent to fight the anti-treaty bands. This news spread through the camps, and the following morning, Sitting Bull called to his side White Bull, his adopted brother Jumping Bull, and one of Chief Black Moon's sons. He led them to the top of a small butte overlooking the village now located on the Rosebud near the mouth of Greenleaf Creek. Sitting Bull wanted these warriors as witnesses to his prayer to walk in Tonka, the great spirit of God. The Supreme Chief and Holy Man, his hair unbraided and free of feathers, turned toward the sun and lit his pipe, which is wrapped in sage. He held the pipe vertical with the stem up, the bowl turned to face his body. As the three witnesses stood silent, Sitting Bull cried out, Walk in Tonka, save me, and give me all my wild game animals, and have them close enough so my people will have food enough this winter, and also let the good men on earth have more power so their tribes get along better, and be of good nature so all Sioux nations get along well. If you do this for me, I will sundance two days and two nights, and will give you a whole buffalo. When the smoke ceased to curl out of the pipe bowl, Sitting Bull wiped his face with sage, and the four men returned to the village. The sun dance began two days later, after the big village moved to a new camping spot 11 miles farther up the Rosebud, near a sacred sandstone formation known as the Picture Rock. The various ceremonies, feasting and singing lasted for four days. On the day Sitting Bull honored his promise to Wankatanka, Throngs of Lakotas and Cheyennes watched from the shade arbors. The chief entered the circular dance area wearing only a breech clout and some sage around his wrists and ankles. He walked to the painted medicine pole in the center and sat down with his back against it, his arms relaxed at his side, his legs straight out. Jumping Bull followed his brother and sat down cross-legged next to him. With a steel awl, a common trade item, Jumping Bull pricked the skin of Sitting Bull's left arm, pulled the skin up, and using a knife cut off the small piece of flesh at the point of the awl. Jumping Bull repeated this procedure until 50 wounds oozed blood up and down the arm. Then he switched to Sitting Bull's right arm. The pieces were no bigger than a match head, but the tiny wounds caused swelling and bleeding nonetheless. The giving of flesh consumed an hour, with tears running down Sitting Bull's face the entire time. The chief wasn't sobbing in pain, however. It was a cry of humility before Wakantanka. Sitting Bull stood up and began to slowly dance while staring just below the sun. He wasn't skewered and tethered to the medicine pole as in his previous sun dances. Glistening with sweat, the blood in his arms turning dark as it dried and scabbed, he danced for hours. Day became night, and still Sitting Bull danced. Like all sun dancers, Sitting Bull fasted prior to the ceremony, and the loss of blood, combined with the lack of nourishment and dehydration, put his body under extreme stress. But he'd made a promise to walk in Tonka. The following morning, as the sun's fiery orb rose above the horizon, Sitting Bull again fixed his eyes just beneath it. The shuffling of his feet was much slower now. His arms hung at his side like lead weights. The world around him was no more. 
No spectators, no movement, no sounds, no colors, just the sun. Then, from the place where he was staring, many figures on horseback appeared, long knives, soldiers. But something was wrong. The soldiers' heads were down, their hats falling off. More and more fell from the sky like so many grasshoppers. A few Indian riders swirled among the long knives, and they too rode with heads down. From above, a powerful voice spoke to Sitting Bull. These white men have no ears, so I give them to you. Sitting Bull understood. Long knives would attack his followers, but the soldiers would suffer a great loss. However, the voice warned, Sitting Bull must not touch the spoils of their victory. Not the soldiers' guns, ammunition, clothing, saddles, or personal items. Nothing. If his people violated this command, the free-roaming Lakotas will be in the white man's clutches at the mercy of the white man. And last, Sitting Bull was not to personally shed blood in this fight. He could carry a bow and arrows for protection, but he was not to take part in the battle. The Lakotas and Cheyennes watching from the shade arbor saw Sitting Bull suddenly falter. The chief looked ill, as if he was about to faint. Several men rushed to his side and eased Sitting Bull to the ground while others brought water. Among those hovering over Sitting Bull was Black Moon. In a voice weak and hoarse, Sitting Bull told Black Moon of his incredible vision, and he asked his cousin to announce it to the people. Black Moon stood and turned to face the spectators. As he told of the Supreme Chief's vision, everyone listened in awe. The truth of a Sundance vision was never questioned. Whatever you foresaw, said the holy man Black Elk, it always came true. And Sitting Bull had proved his closeness to Wakantanka and the gift of prophecy too many times to be doubted. And we all know the rest of the story. I hope. Thank you. At this point, do we have any questions from Mark? Sitting Bull also was an artist, yes, and he drew many, many pictographs of his experiences, his coups uh, throughout his lifetime. And those are in several institutions. They're at the uh, Smithsonian and also at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West in Cody, Wyoming. And was that vision one of his? He did not draw that, that vision. It's been drawn by others. But that was something that was announced to the people, and many remembered that and, and related it, including his nephews. And I should mention that... Uh, in this book, I used a dozen of oral histories that were taken in the 1920s and 1930s, and some of the most important uh, sources were his nephews, One Bull and White Bull, and uh, One Bull was very vivid in describing this vision uh, that Sitting Bull experienced there at the Sundance. Fantastic. Well, we'll get the next person up here. Thank All you right. very much. Sure, you're welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Our next reader is Lori Peck, who will read from the book she co-authored with Kai Erickson, entitled The Continuing Storm, Learning from Katrina. This book is the final volume in an award-winning Katrina bookshelf series and reflects upon what we have learned about Katrina and about America. Kai Erickson is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor Emeritus of Soci Sociology and American Studies at Yale University and is the author of Wayward Puritans, Everything in Its Path a New Species of Trouble and the Sociologist's Eye. Lori Peck is the Professor of Sociology and Director of Natural Hazards Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. She is the author of Behind the Backlash, co-author of Children of Katrina, and co-editor of Displaced and the Handbook of Environmental Sociology. Lori lives up in Boulder. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction. Again, my name is Lori Peek, and I am really honored to be with you today and just wanted to, again, thank the Colorado Humanities and the Center for the Book for sponsoring the Colorado Book Awards and really shedding a light on the importance of literacy and open access to books at this time when books are remain under threat. And so it is an honor to be with you today. and. I am going to be reading from our book, The Continuing Storm, which is actually the eighth book that was published as part of something called the Katrina Bookshelf. And after Katrina happened in 2005, 
Kai Erickson, who is the lead author of this book that I'm going to read from, is now 92 years old, but this was nearly 20 years ago now. Kai went to the editors at the University of Texas Press, and he really made the case that this was an event of such significant proportions with such a need to learn from this event, uh, from a sociological perspective, from an environmental perspective and otherwise. And the University of Texas Press committed to publishing what again they came to call the bookshelf. And so they, this is the eighth in the series and it is the final book in the series that is really meant to capture this uh, event and one of the things we recognized from the beginning is that no one discipline or no one book or one story could ever possibly capture the scope and the scale and the magnitude of destruction from this terrible storm which still stands as one of the most deadly in our national history the most costly and the one that caused the most abrupt displacement of people in our national history. And so that is the section of the book I'm going to read from today. So this is from chapter seven, which is called The Pains of Displacement. Katrina was responsible for driving somewhere between one million and one and a half million people away from their homes. This was not the largest mass evacuation on record. As many as two and a half million people have been known to flee along public highways to avoid incoming storms in Florida. But those evacuations were of relatively short duration. The evacuations caused by Katrina and its cruel successor Rita were certain to be either longer term for those who managed to return home or permanent for those who never did. The departure of New Orleans residents from their city after Katrina became a diaspora. It is hard to find a comparison in this country. One possibility is the exodus from the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. As many as two and a half million people were caught in the undertow of unrelenting dust storms. Another is the Great Migration. The flow is perhaps as many as six million people, most of them black, from the rural south to the industrial north through, throughout the first half of the 20th century. But Katrina was far and away the most abrupt mass dislocation in the United States in modern times. The migration from the Dust Bowl in the, in the Midwest to the far Western states took place over months, stretching into years. The migration of African Americans from Southern states to the North took place over years, stretching into decades. But the evacuation of the places affected by Katrina took place in a matter of hours, stretching into days. Those who participated in those earlier migrations were evacuees in the sense that they were retreating from a threatened place and had little choice about leaving. The land and the associated local and regional economies could no longer sustain them, and so they were seeking a better life elsewhere. But they usually had time to think about it, to plan, to pack up, to choose their moment, and even their destination. It is also worth noting that migrants tend to flow along well-established creek beds. The place of landing was chosen for most of them beforehand by advanced scouts, as were the pathways to be used to reach it. People who migrated from the Great Plains to California or from the rural south to the cities of Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland were following a course that had already been charted by pioneering family members and friends. Thus, many who chose to follow uh, already established trails had kinfolk ready to welcome them upon their arrival to help them to settle. In contrast, the human cells ejected from the living organism of their community in the Gulf region were blown by errant winds to every point of the compass. Some found shelter in faraway places like Albany, Anchorage, Denver, Minneapolis, Salt Lake City, and Las Vegas. One does not need to be wholly familiar with the civic culture of New Orleans to appreciate that these were strange and remote terrains to the city's evacuees. Most of them were not blown so far away. Roughly 40% of Katrina's survivors landed, at least initially, in the states of Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, as well as in Louisiana and Mississippi. No more than a car's drive or a bus ride from what had recently been their home. But for many of them, home remained as distant a reality as it was for those who found themselves thousands of miles away. 
Many of those who ended up far from home after Katrina did not choose their destination. In the chaotic days after the storm, officials placed Katrina survivors in vehicles of every kind to move them out of the drowned city. An untold number of these persons who were shuffled onto airplanes were informed of their destination before boarding and then told in mid-flight that they were heading somewhere else. This happened to quite a number of the estimated 15,000 Katrina survivors who ended up in Denver, Colorado and surrounding regions of the state. They thought that they were on their way to Texas, only to find out in midair that they had been rerouted to the Mile High City. Among that group destined for Denver was a 41-year-old African-American man who described the terror and uncertainty that followed Katrina. He said, I quote, I thought I was really going to die because me and my girls, we slept on the streets for five days. I didn't know where I was going. I just got on a plane. I was scared because I had never been on a plane before. Everybody thought they were going to San Antonio, but then they winded up here. One of the mothers who landed in Denver after Katrina spoke of another problem she had encountered in the New Orleans airport. She watched families being split apart there and she refused to board an airplane until there were enough seats available for her and her children. She said, then there were planes leaving and I told them I had five children and I don't want to be separated. I told them I will not be separated from my kids because there were people crying, mothers crying, saying that their kids are missing. So this one plane was about to take off and they needed three or four more people. And I was like, no, no, we need six seats. So we missed that plane and we waited for another couple of hours until the next plane could leave. This woman's decision to wait for the next flight probably spared her family the suffering of separation that more than 5,000 children and their loved ones endured after Katrina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Okay. Now, do we have any questions for Lori? Yes. Why were they rerouted? Yeah, so the question was, why were the Katrina survivors rerouted? And so this is an interesting question and it has so much to do with uh, politics as much as the disaster. And so uh, many of the Katrina survivors sought shelter in Texas and Texas had opened up several mass shelters in Houston, Dallas, Austin and elsewhere. But the Houston mass shelters quickly became overwhelmed and there were far more people that were seeking refuge in Texas than could be absorbed. And so back in 2005, Texas had a Republican governor and so did Colorado. And those governors were friends. And Texas's governor picked up the phone and he called Colorado's governor and he said, we, we literally have no more humanitarian assistance available for the number of people who are seeking shelter. And so Colorado quickly opened up, some of you may recall, Lowry Air Force Base over Labor Day weekend. They cleaned the Air Force Base, a series of volunteers, Red Cross workers and others, and they cleaned up the barracks at, uh, at Lowry. And that's where thousands of Katrina survivors were either brought on bus, they arrived via car, or like the man who I quoted first in the book, they were rerouted mid-flight on an airplane and ended up in Colorado. So thank you for the question very much. We've got time for one more. Yes. Oh, thank you, and thank you for your beautiful poetry uh, and the illustrations that you shared earlier. Uh, yes, it does. Kai and I, it is very interesting. We are honored to be a part of a category related to history and biography and to join true historians in this quest, but Kai and I are actually sociologists who study disaster, and we have both spent our career in communities, as you may have picked up on from the names of all those uh, books that we previously worked on that really draw on ethnographic accounts. And one of the maps we have in the book actually shows that Katrina survivors were actually scattered across all 50 states. And so that trying to figure out how to house survivors in such an abrupt displacement is indeed part of the story we tell in here. And the Katrina trailers are part of that story, but so are the homes of Americans that were opened up to survivors, temporary hotels and other uh, mouse shelters and so forth as part of the book too. So thank you for sharing that and thank you for asking and thank you again for listening. Thank you. Thank you.
Now we'll hear from Flint Whitlock, who will read from his book, Life is a Game, Adventures of a World War II Interrogator and a U.S. Soccer Pioneer, that he had co-authored with Dr. Gunnell. G.K. Joe Gunnell was born in Germany and came to the U.S. as a teenager, just as the Nazis were taking over that country. He joined the U.S. Army while in college, and because German was his native language, he was assigned to be an interrogator of German prisoners of war, both during the war and prior to the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. Before his death, Dr. Gunnell gave his voluminous notes, photos, and artwork to his friend and fellow soccer enthusiast Flint Whitlock a few years before he died in hopes that Flint, the award-winning author of 15 books, four of which have been finalists in the Colorado Book Awards, um, and a 2021 inductee into the Colorado Authors Hall of Fame could complete his autobiography. Flint lives in Denver. Welcome aboard. I have a little fan back there right here. <laughs> Yay. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, as you heard, this is the fifth time I've been a finalist uh, for the Colorado Book Awards. Um, and you know the old saying, always an usher, never a bridegroom. <laughs> and uh, so I feel that, uh, you know, maybe this year, but we've got an awful lot of great uh, competitors and, and uh, other finalists in, in this year's uh, competition. So I, I feel honored to be among this uh, distinguished crowd. Before I read an excerpt from Life is a Game, this is the book here, for some reason it didn't make it to the back table. I'm going to have to talk to my publisher about that. Um, I want to give you a little backstory about how I came to collaborate with uh, Joe Gunnell. Uh, with his uh, autobiography. After playing soccer in college and then in West Germany when I was in the Army in the 1960s, I came to Colorado in 1969 and was stationed at Fort Carson until I became a civilian again. I became heavily involved in the local soccer scene with such people as Horst Richardson, who is the uh, Colorado College women's soccer coach and men's coach uh, in, in that, at that time. And also my friend Dick Burns, who is here in the, in the audience, uh, who was uh, kind of Mr. Soccer in Colorado Springs uh, running uh, the, the show down here. I started to hear about Joe Gunnell, this mysterious figure, uh, who lived up in Littleton as being the godfather of Colorado soccer. And after I moved to Denver in 1974 to be the public relations director for the Denver Dynamos, the first professional soccer team in Colorado, uh, I began to get more acquainted with Joe and how he was at the heart of soccer in Colorado. Later, after I became an author and military historian, thanks to the support of my wife, Marianne Watson, who's sitting up here as well, Joe and I would get together on a, about a monthly basis for lunch and he began telling me more and more about his soccer career and his military career to the point that he gave me his writings, photographs, and artwork. He was an excellent artist and asked me to help him finish his autobiography. I'm happy to say that Colorado Humanities has chosen to honor life as a game as a finalist in this year's Colorado Book Awards. And I'm sorry to say that I wasn't able to get the book published La until last year, which was nine years after he passed away. Uh, let me start by reading from the back cover of the book. Uh, it says, soldier, scientist, artist, author, and the Johnny Appleseed of American soccer. His was truly a life in full. German-born Gottfried Kurt Joe Gunnell moved to the U.S. as a young teen. During World War II, he became one of the U.S. Army's famed Ritchie Boys a highly trained interrogator of German prisoners of war and war criminals. He had a lot to do with interrogate, interrogating uh, many of the high-ranking Nazis before the Nuremberg war crimes trials. His artistic talent and interest in paleonology, which is basically prehistoric botany, led him to write and illustrate two well-regarded books on Colorado wildflowers. And woven throughout his life was his passion for soccer which led him from the playgrounds in Germany to the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. And I want to read a few paragraphs 
uh, near the end of, of the book, there were many passages I could have pulled out about his, his life in Germany uh, under the, the Nazi regime or uh, when he began uh, starting soccer programs in Colorado and elsewhere around the country or about uh, his, uh, his military experiences. But I wanted to focus in on something at the end that he wrote, and uh, I, I basically conclude the book with it. And uh, he wrote, on Veterans Day 2006, I was feted with other veterans at the Damon Runyon School in Littleton by my friend Michael Taylor. When he introduced me, he said something about me being part of the greatest generation, a distinction that I found uncomfortable. I blurted out to him to shut up about the greatest generation. When I returned home that evening, I wrote him a letter of apology, and this is what Joe wrote. Mike, I was emotionally upset when I looked at all those innocent faces at the school because I saw myself 80 years earlier among my classmates on a school outing in pre-war Germany, circa 1927. In our Sunday best, we were all basking in the joyous event and the desire to look good in the photo. And there's a photo of his school group uh, at, on page four in the book. And Joe said, I remembered how all those eager kids, eager to learn, eager to please, eager to do well, eager to grow up, were exploited, brainwashed, and killed by Hitler's mania. And all in the name of love of country and duty for the fatherland as patriots. As far as I can remember, only two of my classmates survived the slaughter that is known as World War II. The others were mesmerized by Hitler and became dead German patriots. Mike, I'm scared by flag waving and glorifying war and killing of crimes committed under patriotic fervor that are condoned and excused by self-appointed patriots. So when I looked at those innocent faces at the school auditorium, I wondered what will become of these kids? Will they be sacrificed in the name of patriotism? Will they be atomized by nuclear bombs? Who knows? There never was a good war, Mike. Good for whom? Maybe for the politicians, industrialists, and generals. Wars are good and profitable. To glorify war is a crime, and Tom Brokaw's The Greatest Generation is hogwash. It's embarrassing to me and all the World War II veterans I know. We did what we had to do, period. And then on the next page, there's a picture of young German school kids giving the Nazi salute to Adolf Hitler. And Joe wrote, Mike, are these Littleton kids immune to brainwashing, to infection by that patriotic virus spread by warmongers? Are today's kids different from my duped classmates in the 1920s? I don't think so. Kids are kids all over the world. More than 200 years ago, Samuel Johnson, English philosopher and essayist, exposed the danger of patriotic fervor when he wrote, patriotism is the last refuge of scoundrels. I'm even wondering if it's wrong, damaging, and dangerous to honor those poor soldiers who gave their lives. I do, I do believe they should be mem remembered as any loved one who dies. Maybe they should be cited as examples of the cruelty and randomness of war. I know that I'm committing sacrilege when I question the hallowed deeds of war heroes. I'm not blaming them. They did what had to be done. But should killing be glorified? If killing the enemy is one's job, one's duty, and it most certainly is the purpose of soldiering, then excellence, performance above and beyond the call of duty deserves to be recognized and rewarded. A soldier is taught and trained to do one thing, and that's to kill the enemy. It comes down to kill or be killed. I was trained to be a killer during infantry basic training at Camp Walters, Texas. I was lucky. I never had to use any of the weapons I was trained to use. Mike, I'm worried about those Damon Runyon school kids and all other kids. How can they be protected, informed, warned of the dangers? Will they fall for all of the lies and promises like previous generations? Can't the parents and teachers, pastors and priests and other role models at least tell them the truth of the horror of war, that scourge of humanity? We don't want to blame the innocent soldiers who are sent to fight, to kill and be killed as we did during the Vietnam War but we don't have to make them heroes and thereby, thereby glorify war. Again, Mike, my apologies. I hope you understand my feeling and the emotions that overwhelm me at your school. And on the last page, I just want to wrap it up. 
Joe Gunnell, soldier, scientist, artist, and soccer icon, died at age 92 in Littleton, Colorado on May 13th, 2013, from a variety of ailments, the primary one being cancer. At a well-attended funeral service at Fort Logan National Cemetery, his ashes were laid to rest beside those of his first wife, Hilda. His was an extraordinary life that touched and enriched the lives of tens of thousands of people, especially soccer players and coaches, who may never have met him or even heard his name. I was indeed fortunate to be considered one of his many friends, and I treasure the many lunches and conversations we had over a smothered burrito or a chili relleno at his favorite Littleton Mexican restaurant, Mission Trujillo. In 2020, I'll skip that paragraph. While editing this memoir, so many questions came to mind and I found myself wanting to reach for the phone and ask him for an answer, but then I brought myself up short with the realization that he's gone. Gone, but certainly not forgotten. Never forgotten. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clint. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Everybody else had questions. Come on. <laughs> yes. Uh, the question was, uh, what was the process of writing and what materials did I draw on? As I mentioned, uh, when Joe and I would get together, uh, starting about 15 years ago, uh, he, would, he would come to lunch and he would have a file folder, or he'd have a box, or he'd have you know, an envelope, and, and it was filled with his writings. He, his original title for the book was uh, Soccer in GI Boots, but I wanted to expand that and, and uh, change it to, to life as a game. He didn't object to that. <laughs> uh, but he, he, he brought me just a treasure trove of material and I started to try and organize it. And I realized that, that there were some gaps, so I used some of my knowledge as a military historian to fill in those gaps. And sometimes uh, he would have two or three different um, recollections of the same event and they were all a little bit different. So I had to figure out well, what was the correct one? And uh, so that, that became interesting, and, and that's why I you know, really missed being able to, to ask him what, what really happened here in this particular episode. Uh, and, and he gave me a bunch of, as I mentioned, he was, he was an artist, he was a photographer, uh, and he took pictures and, and made drawings and sketches and watercolor paintings uh, throughout his time uh, in the Army. And some of these are, are, are really beautiful, and when we re reproduce them in, in the book, um, but uh, it was it was uh, something that I wanted to to accomplish while he was still alive, but wasn't able to do that. And and I'm sorry that he wasn't around to to see the final product. Yeah, thank you. The question was, uh, do I still have all the material that he uh, uh, gave me for the, the uh, project? And I do still have those. Uh, I'm on the board of directors at the Broomfield Veterans Museum. And uh, about a year ago, we had an exhibit uh, of Joe's paintings and photographs uh, at the museum. So uh, it did get a little more uh, widespread distribution. He had a PhD, right? Yes, he had a PhD. Uh, he, the question was, was he a professor? Uh, no, uh, he got his PhD at Indiana, Indiana University where he started the first uh, soccer team that Indiana U had. Um, and shortly thereafter, he uh, got a job in the field of paleobotany, I guess you could call it, uh, and was hired by Marathon Oil that was in Littleton at that time. And so he came out to help Marathon figure out where the likely places that you could find oil or natural gas based on the prehistoric plant uh, evidence that was there. But he did not, uh, he was not a teacher, no. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is historical fiction finalist Amy Runyon. 
who will read from her book, The School for German Brides. Amy is joining us via Zoom from Estes Park. Her book is set in World War II and follows the story of Hannah Rom Rombauer, a young German woman who was sent to live with her aunt and uncle after her mother's death. Author Amy Runyon has been honored as a historical novel Society Editor's Choice Selection and is a three-time finalist for the Colorado Book Awards. She was also a nominee for Rocky Mountain Fiction, Writer of the Year. Amy is active as an educator and speaker in the writing community and beyond. Amy? First of all, I have to thank um, the good people um, here for allowing me to come in virtually from Estes Park. Um, as you can imagine, it's quite a trek to Colorado Springs, which is my old stopping grounds. Uh, but thank you very much to the people of Colorado Humanities and the East Library for organizing this for me to come in remotely. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to read to you from The School for German Brides, which is uh, my sixth work of historical fiction. Um, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. Um, so the School for German Brides was actually born from research that I completed while I was writing my fifth book, Across the Winding River. Um, for those of you, which was another Colorado Book Award finalist, um, uh, and for that book, uh, I, there was a wedding scene um, amongst a young uh, German girl and a Nazi officer. Um, and she was very young, the officer was old, older, and she was kind of coerced into the a not so great situation. Uh, which kind of mirrors some of the story from the School for German Brides. But I researched the wedding traditions and stumbled across um, the, the story of the bride schools. And they're mentioned very briefly in Across the Winding River, but it was an idea that stuck with me. I needed to write about these bride schools. And so what was a German bride school? They were kind of like the name says on the box. They were kind of like home ec classes with a heavy dose of Nazi propaganda. Um, it was a class, uh, they were schools where women were taught how to keep home, how to keep, because they, they were born from the idea of the mother schools, the Mütterschule, that emerged in the 1920s because there was a very high rate of infant mortality after World War I. And so that's kind of what gave impetus to this idea. And the idea stuck with me um, through the writing of Across the Winey River. And I was very fortunate to find a home at William Morrow for this book. Um, so I'm going to, you know, one thing that people have noticed is that this part of the book takes place before one of our main characters arrives at the bride school. And this is the part that's at and after the bride school. Seems like a lot happens before we even get there, but really it is the reality for both of our main characters because it's a story of a young uh, German woman um, from the right background and a, a young Jewish woman who's decidedly not of the right background. And there are two stories as they enter into uh, marriage and motherhood and um, how disparate they are. But really, Hannah, our, our German character, enters into, uh, or Aryan character, enters into the bride school the minute she steps off of the train into her aunt and uncle's care after the death of her mother. So I'm going to go ahead and read from the first chapter when Hannah actually arrives at the bride school on Schwanenverde Island. Chapter 31, Hannah, November 1939. As I crossed the threshold at the bride school, I felt just as nervous as the day I descended from the, the train from Tiesendorf and entered into Uncle Otto and Aunt Charlotte's household. The worn suitcase was long gone and my dresses were far smarter, but my worry stone still weighed heavy in my, in my little, uh, down my little handbag as though it were a cannonball instead of a few ounces of rose quartz. I tried leaving it tucked in the back of my drawer, but more and more I was compelled to feel the surface smoothed from years of worry of the stone between my thumb and forefinger. Each time I glided my fingers along the surface, I felt myself chanting a prayer. Mama, keep me safe. Mama, get me out of this place. But these were prayers that could not be answered. As the iron gates clicked behind me, it was plain. There was no escape for me. The villa on Schwanenwerde Island was just as luxurious as Friedrich had claimed. It was newly built and designed specifically to teach young women like me how to be the perfect German bride, the perfect German wife, the perfect German mother. Uh, 
The building was designed to be light and full of air, to bring in the verdant landscape of the island and the wholesome sounds of the lake, where with light come shadows. A maid showed me to a foyer and whisked my case away to the depths of the building. She gave me no instructions other than to wait, and I felt dwarfed by the vast empty room. I pulled my green tree coat close around me. I'll show you to your room, an imposing woman said with that preamble, gesturing for me to, for me to follow her. She was tall and broad shoulders, dwarfing me in size. She used our time walking through the room to lecture me about how um, to make the best use of my time at the villa. I was to learn how to be this virtual leader for my family, but to follow my husband in all things. I ascended the staircase behind the head matron, Frau Schultz, as she introduced herself, and watched as our dark figures entwined on the walls as we walked past. The wooden floors gleamed with polish and there wasn't a speck of dust to be found. There was no sign of life beyond the writhing of our shadows on the corridor wall. We stopped at one of the doors and she opened it with a key from a large ring at her waist. Here you are, dear. I trust you'll be comfortable. The captain has, uh, captain has asked that you have a nice view and some privacy. So I've ensured that you have a lovely view of the lake and gardens. I crossed the room and peered beyond the heavy drapes. The trees were thick beyond the villa, as well as around the rest of the properties on the island. I could make out the rather exotic thatched roof of an adjacent house, but aside from that, it would be easy to think the villa was the only house for miles. Beyond the trees, Lake Vansi seemed to stretch like an ocean, with gentle waves that ushered in a cool breeze all year. I could almost imagine the salty sea air, though we were miles from the ocean. If it had been summer, it would have been paradise itself. In winter, it was moody and gray and hopelessly beautiful. It's lovely, thank you, I said, giving her a genuine smile. This might be endurable. The room was small but nicely furnished. I'd expecting some, expected something more like a dormitory, but this was closer to the feel of a small, quaint hotel. A, suitable, a subtle smell of coffee and, uh, and toast permeated the air, though it was long past breakfast, mixed with a gentle flirt perfume of cut flowers. You take your time settling in. Luncheon won't be for several more hours. She took her leave, the door clicking behind her as she left. My case had already been placed on the chair by the efficient maid. I removed my suit jacket and heels, attempting to breathe for a few moments, having no having to mingle with uh, before having to mingle with people at real time. I turned my attention to the bouquet of flowers on the desk and noticed a card from Friedrich. May your time here prepare you for a life of service to the fatherland. I put the note back to the cream-colored hothouse roses and gardenias that probably cost a king's ransom. No mention of love or our impending nuptials. It was all about the country, the party, and the fear of her. There was no room for romance in this. Perhaps it was just as well I couldn't be certain of how I felt for Friedrich. It put us on equal footing. He reserved his affections because he was devoted to his cause, and I because I was unready to bestow them on anyone. I lay down on the bed, a million thoughts crossing my mind. What on earth did this school plan to teach us? Would Aunt Charlotte be able to pull off a wedding to her standard in two months' time? Or would I get a reprieve? Would Mila find Mama's medical texts in, in my wardrobe and report them to Aunt Charlotte and Uncle Otto? If the marriage to Friedrich happened, and it seemed like I had little choice in the matter, what would remain of me? There was a knock at my door, and I sat up, wiping the haze from my eyes, and crossed to answer it. They told me you just arrived, Clara said, sweeping me into her arms. I am so glad you're here. You have no idea, but you're the answer to all my prayers. If I made any, that is. I had no idea you were coming to, I said, melting for a moment at the relief of seeing a familiar face. How long have you been here? Since yesterday, she said, and it's dull as a hundred-year-old garden hoe. I've never been happier to see a person in my whole life. So you're engaged, I asked. No one told me. Much had happened in my short university career, and keeping tabs on Clara simply hadn't been possible. Well, it was rather sudden. Ernst was a good friend of the man I was dating when you went off to uni. We went on a double date, and it was clear that I was better suited for Ernst, and Georg was better for Ilse. Ernst met with my father not long ago, and things fell into place. I imagine Georg will propose to Ilse any day. It's a shame she won't be here, too. She's lovely, really. Your head must be spinning, but are you happy? She paused a moment. No one considered these things anymore. 
Oh, well, he's nice enough, not bad to look at, promising career. He's no crapped and shrode, mind you, but it's an eligible match. A few months earlier, I would have asked her if she was certain about this man and if she was ready to make such a momentous decision. But it would serve no purpose to ask the question now. If she were here, the marriage was as good as consecrated. So thank you very much. That is my passage from the School for German Brides, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Here in Colorado Springs, there are a lot of uh, German brides, and we were mm -hmm. wondering if the, any of them had potentially gone to any of these schools um, historically in this area. Um, well, you know, I actually did not come across, uh, you know, focus on the German brides that came uh, over here. Um, it was about the schools for the, you know, the women that were um, in Germany at the time. And I thought it was kind of important to tell uh, the story of, you know, because there are so many World War II narratives. I've told several of them myself. This is my kind of my oeuvre behind me here. Um, but um, I wanted to tell a story of what it was like for women in the lion's den, so to speak. German brides that, that would have immigrated here and trained back in Germany prior to moving to the Springs. And yep. there was a really a huge population of German brides in Colorado Springs. It's part of the history of this area. I was just wondering if, like, you know, several of them are still alive, although, of course, many of oh. them Right, but I just kind of wondered if you, like, not you, but if you did or someone asked them, you know. Oh, so, okay. You, attend, you know, were you, a, were you a student at the School for German Brides? You know, if any of them might have said, oh, yes, you know, I was sent to the School for German Brides. So the interesting thing, the article that kind of spurned this whole book was from, I want to say 2014 in the New Yorker, because the records were released, um, uh, were unsealed from the German government. Um, but I do think that a lot of the women just did not talk about what, what, what happened. Now, we, there, a lot of the records we have of the German bride schools were from like the, the, um, the Frauenwarte, which was the, um, the kind of the women's periodical, like the, the Nazi equivalent of good housekeeping for Nazi housewives. And um, that's where a lot of the information comes from, but they did unseal some documents. This is absolutely, this is my lockdown book. I wrote this in 300 word stretches at night in between homeschooling my two young children um, as a newly single mother. And so this is kind of, you know, it was not a book where I was able to get elbow deep into the archives like I am able to do for some of my current books right now. Um, I'm actually off to do a research trip for um, my upcoming book, which is very exciting. But um, so I wasn't able, as I tried and tried and tried to, uh, to contact um, the archives to, to find maybe some of those, ar those um, interviews with the women or any of those things, but it was, uh, everything was shut down um, for months and months and months. And so um, I really, this is a, of a lot of my books, I, I had to depend on the primary source materials that were easily accessible online, which did limit it to a certain degree. But, you know, I was really happy with the, the ultimate, you know, kind of resolution, which was the struggle, you know, the, the overarching theme was the struggles for women in what was an extremely patriarchal society. And we think of the United States as being definitely firmly in the patriarchal category, especially back in the 1940s. And Russia being, you know, because I, I wrote the Daughters for the Night Sky, um, which is from, from the Russian perspective. And it was a little bit, at least on paper, more progressive. Women were allowed to fight on the front lines if they wanted to. They could fly in the, the Red Army if they wanted to. Um, it wasn't mandatory, but they could. Um, and whereas, you know, in the United States, the women were kind of part of the ancillary forces in, in various means, um, as you know, as in the waves and the wax and all those organizations. But in Germany, women were expected to stay home. Of course, they helped the war efforts in their own ways, but it was not. And it, most of this book does lead up to the, the just the earliest days of the war, but it was not expected that beyond, you know, kind of bandage rolling sort of, you know, nursing type roles that the woman would get involved. 
So it was, a, a, you know, women were banned from things, a, an important theme is that women were not allowed to practice medicine or law. Um, and so uh, um, Hannah's, uh, the, our main uh, character, her mother was banned from practicing medicine, even though she was a licensed physician. And that's kind of a main theme. Uh, women could be midwives and nothing else. Um, so that's kind of a common theme. And to see, you know, even though we didn't get into the, the real meat of um, you know, the curricula for the, the bride school, so to speak, um, we got it, we get a taste of what it was like to be a, a woman in this very, very anti-woman um, society. So that was the whole point of the book. Thank you, Amy. But to sort of wrap up, I'll give you guys a little bit more uh, uh, a description of the other uh, historical fiction finalists who were unable to make it here today. Um, I'll, I'll share about their, the, the titles in their books. Uh, Sandra Dallas' book, Little Souls, is set in the midst of World War I raging overseas, but focusing on how the home front is battling for survival. Dallas has been dubbed a quintessential American voice in Vogue magazine and is the author of over a dozen novels, including Prayers for Sale and Tall Grass. Dallas was a business week reporter for 25 years covering the Rocky Mountain region and splits her time between Denver and Shor Georgetown. The third finalist in the historical um, category is Callie Ferrardo Anstein in her book, Woman of Light, which is set in Denver in the 1930s and follows the story of Luz Little Light Lopez, a tea leaf reader, a snake charmer, and a factory worker who is run out of town by a violent white mob. Callie is the author of Sabrina and Karina, a finalist for the National Book Award, the Penn and Binghamton Prize, the Story Prize, and the winner of the American Book Award. She has written for the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, L, the American Scholar, Boston Review, and elsewhere, and has received the Denver Mayor's Award for Global Impact in the Arts, and she lives in Arvada. On that note, thank you all very much for coming down to the Pikes Peak Library District. Um, I'd like to thank the East library staff that helps us put this together, especially Jane, who is running around uh, doing all the tech stuff. So thank you, Jane. Uh, and I'd also like to thank all the Colorado Book Award entrants, uh, the selectors, the judges, and volunteers, as well as the Colorado Humanities um, and Center for the Book staff. Uh, they've put in endless hours uh, making this uh, for us. Um, we'd hope that you join us at the beautiful and historic Penrose House here in Colorado Springs on Saturday, June 10th, 2023 for the Colorado Book Award finalist celebration and winners announcement. Uh, we will include a brief readings by the, by the winners and the reception. Uh, to get a ticket and learn more, please visit coloradohumanities.org. And thank you very much for coming down here uh, to the Springs. And a final thank you to all you Colorado uh, writers. Um, thank you very much for your support. Um, we look forward to seeing all your work um, and, and seeing the rest of the readings uh, throughout the rest of the month. So good night and safe travels.